Hi, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of cardiovascular drugs, and this is recording part four. Now we're going to talk about calcium channel blockers and some general information to start that you should definitely know. So calcium channel blockers bind to calcium channels. Specifically, we're talking about L-type voltage-gated channels that are contained in cardiac and vascular smooth muscle. The goal is to decrease intracellular calcium. When we do that, four things happen that you need to be aware of. It can decrease myocardial contractility. It can decrease heart rate. It can decrease activity of the SA node or conduction through the AV node. And it can cause relaxation of vascular smooth muscle. So if that's the case, we know that certain patients may have adverse effects from calcium channel blockers. Patients who already have impaired left ventricular function, patients who are hypovolemic, may have exaggerated side effects from calcium channel blockers. Now, all the calcium channel blockers are pretty well protein bound. They undergo hepatic metabolism for the most part, with at least one exception that we'll highlight. They may potentiate the effect of neuromuscular blocking drugs. When we dose them IV, we can give them as a bolus or as a continuous infusion. They can also potentiate activity of local anesthetics by blocking sodium ion flow, and therefore they can increase the risk of, so of local anesthetic toxicity. The first class of drugs we're going to talk about are the benzothiapines, and specifically that would be diltiazem, also called cardizem. This drug is a first-line medication for supraventricular tachydysrhythmias. So for example, you have a patient in atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular rate, calcium channel blockers may help slow down their heart rate. By blocking the calcium channels of the AV node, we block conduction through the node and the ventricular response. A normal loading dose is 0.25 milligrams per kilogram, which is about 20 milligrams in most people. Usually we give it as a slow IV bolus over about two minutes. If a second dose is needed, it would be 0.35 milligrams per kilogram, which you can redose two to 15 minutes after the first dose. You can also run a diltiazem infusion at a rate of 5 to 15 milligrams per hour. Most people start at 10 milligrams per hour. Diltiazem may have some role in chronic hypertension, and you can take diltiazem orally as well as IV. And it does this by causing peripheral arterial vasodilation due to relaxation of that smooth muscle as we discussed before. The elimination half-life of diltiazem is four to six hours, although metabolites may hang around for quite a bit longer. Side effects include dizziness, headaches, flushing, and interestingly, gingival hyperplasia, or overgrowth of the gums. Patients who should avoid diltiazem include patients who are having an acute myocardial infarction because it decreases contractility, patients who are hypotensive and who have second or third degree heart block. As we said, it can be taken orally as well, and there are immediate, sustained, and extended release formulations in order to treat angina, hypertension, and atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. A related drug is verapamil. It's called a phenylalkylamine, but I think of verapamil and diltiazem as being, if not the same family, very similar to each other. It's also used to treat supraventricular tachydysrhythmias. It depresses the AV node, and therefore a common side effect could be bradycardia. It's also used in treatment of angina and hypertension due to its ability to vasodilate coronary and peripheral artery beds. Side effects are similar, including the hypotension, also constipation, headaches, flushing, and gingival hyperplasia. The verapamil is also used in the treatment of migraines and cluster headaches, and has an elimination half-time of 6 to 12 hours. <clears throat> So we've talked about two drugs that are calcium, calcium channel blockers used to treat primarily heart rate. Now we're going to focus on some calcium channel blockers that are mostly used to treat um, blood pressure. These are the dihydropyridines. The first is nifedipine, also called procardia. It's used to treat angina pectoris and especially coronary vasospasm. It is a coronary and a peripheral artery vasodilator and you would expect it to cause hypotension. Nimodipine is similar, but it can cross the blood-brain barrier because it's lipid-soluble. So this could be very useful in treatment or prevention of cerebral vasospasm. 
nicardipine or cardine has virtually no effect on the SA or the AV node, so it's really used as a vasodilator. It treats angina and hypertension by vasodilating coronary, vasodilating coronary and peripheral arteries. Usually it's run as an IV infusion, starting at 5 milligrams an hour and titrating up by about 2.5 milligrams per hour every 5 minutes. The maximum dose is typically 15 milligrams per hour. Nicardamine is also a tocolytic drug, which means it can um, stop labor when it's not desired, although we don't see it being used for that frequently in our institution. Clavidipine, or Clevaprex, is in a lipid emulsion, so it looks like propofol if it's not labeled. Um, it has an elimination half time of just one minute because instead of going to the liver, it's actually metabolized by plasma or tissue esterases. So very rapid metabolism. The starting dose is one to two milligrams per hour, and then you can titrate up to about 16, usually without a loading dose because again, it's such a fast acting drug. But some people do like to give a bolus, and usually the dose I've seen is 0.25 to 0.5 milligrams. Remember, the concentration of this is half a milligram per mil, so we're talking about one milliliter or even less as your bolus dose. I also just want to point out amlodipine, which is called Norvasc, a very common oral preparation, and it's pretty similar to nifedipine or nicardipine, again used for the management of hypertension. I've created here a little chart that helps me categorize these drugs. So you can see verapamil and deltiazem in one category, the nifedipine, nicardipine, clavidipine in what I would call more the vascular category compared to the first is more of a heart rate category. And you can see they have similar effects on blood pressure but different effects on heart rate since these verapamil and deltiazem are designed to decrease heart rate, whereas the others have no effect on heart rate and so you may see some, in, some reflex tachycardia instead. That ends our discussion about cardiovascular drugs. Please do let me know if you have any questions, and we'll continue with the next section shortly.